remain with me standing. I um, yesterday was such an alarming thing, and I I'm just being honest with you. I could not. I tried, and I was doing other things, but all day long I was on whatever news feed or whatever social media feed that I could find some information on. I've been three different times to Israel. Shannon and I have been together once. And my heart was broken to see women and children murdered in the streets. And as Israel stood with us during 9-11, it is our responsibility because we know as believers The word says, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And this is not about politics, not about military, not about any of those kind of things. This is about the peace of Jerusalem. This is about a moment in time when when spouses are worried about their spouse because they've been taken. Children are away from their mom and dad today. The elderly have been murdered in their streets. And so I want us just to stand as a church and pray for Israel right now as they helped and prayed for us in 9-11. I want us to do that again, and I want us to stand here together and say, Lord, heal their land in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus, we stand with your people, Lord. And as we have been grafted in that vine, God, we say that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, God, will find peace. God, will find what they need today, Lord. I pray for every believer in Jesus Christ in Israel right now, in the surrounding nations around there. I pray, Lord Jesus, for every family that has lost loved ones today. I pray for every child. I pray that they will be sent back home, God, to be with their parents and grandparents. I pray for everybody that's lost somebody. God, I pray for the hurt. I pray for the destruction, Lord. God, heal the land. Heal our land. God, we repent for our sins and our trespasses against you, Lord. And God, I pray that one more time, God, that you would do a work of grace. And God, in this tragic situation, I pray that your glory will be revealed. And God, we give you all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. Families, with the people that were dedicating babies today, we are sure glad to have you. If you don't have a church home, welcome. Because we want you to be a part of what God's doing here. You got family traveling for all over. I don't know what team the Bowers family is pulling for this morning, but I would say it was probably the O's. Can I get an amen? (laughs) I see all the orange back there. I like orange too, just a different orange, okay? (laughs) But we're sure glad to have everybody here today. Family traveled in and works of grace has been done. So we're just so happy to see you here today and to part. So thankful for your faithfulness in tithing, giving, and offerings. We have the boxes in the back, text to give, online giving. The way that we're able to make an impact in this world today is through your faithfulness and what you're doing. So thank you so much for that. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I just want you to hold your place there for just a moment. This morning, I'm going to talk about addiction. Addiction that faces all of our lives. Um, We were somewhere yesterday, and the restaurant was actually called Wing Addiction. I don't know what that was, subliminal or not. But as we were there, I was thinking to myself, if 10 wings are good, 20 would be better. You may know what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen or no me at least? If one basket full of fries were good, me getting in Shanna's basket full of fries would be better. If one thing of ranch would be good, this would be better. Our personality sometimes says these words, if one is good, two would be better. When we allow 
the wrong habits to get in our life. And if we stay on those wrong habits, they become an addiction in our life. The addiction will become our God if we're not careful. Now let me say that again. Wrong habits, no matter what it is. I was in 9 o'clock service today. Uh, I get a notification every week with a lot of you that are, are, are iPhone, Apple people. You get a weekly summary of how much you've been online. And I looked at it, and I almost like got an Android so I wouldn't be online that much. It was almost that bad. But, but when you realize what is happening there and the things that are happening there, that you can spend hour after hour after hour. Anybody thought I haven't been online much this week until you got that notification? You wasn't, you wasn't on your phone that much. You didn't text that much. You didn't talk that much. You didn't do those things because of all that. But then the stark contrast was there. And see, the wrong habits will lead to addiction. They'll lead to addiction as far as substance goes. They'll lead to addiction as far as our time and our effort that's there. Addiction breeds violence. I think the statistic is 57% of calls that our law enforcement gets to go to domestic violence calls has something to do with drugs and alcohol. So addiction breeds violence. It breeds financial ruin. It breeds health problems. It separates you from love and loved ones. Addiction will scream, make you afraid, and bully you into chaos. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. That it will scream so loud that it will say these words to you. Unless you have me, whether that's Drugs, whether that's alcohol, whether that's pornography, whether that's religion, or whatever that has become a God in your life, it will scream so loud that will say these words to you, you cannot make it without me. It is the person that looks at you, and when you look in the mirror in the morning, it looks at you and says, without a little bit of alcohol, Without a little bit of drugs, without a little bit of pleasure, without a little bit of religion, which the religion that I'm talking about is a religion that doesn't try to bring people up or bring them to Jesus Christ, but a religion that separates people and says, you're no longer good enough for this. And so understanding what I'm saying here, it's an addiction that we have in our life and in our hearts, and we have to be so careful. Now, we love to talk about when I was a student pastor, you know, there was only three sins. All my student pastors know what I'm talking about. There's only drugs and alcohol and bad relationship. But let me tell you, you can be addicted to gossip. And gossip has destroyed as many people as drugs and alcohol has. You can be addicted to religion. You can be addicted to pornography. You can be addicted to, and I've already said it, if 10 wings are good, more, more, more. You go to buffets, and we all know that they're not good. But there's just the sold on the fact of more, more, and more. And then we end up with financial problems, with health issues, with things that are in our life, and we look at our own life and say, how did we get here? Let me, let's see what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, such as common to man. Let me say this to each and every person. And when I grew up in church, I believed that when you got a certain age, you wouldn't have any more temptations anymore. Our students are looking at me and saying, Pastor, don't have any more temptations anymore. But let me tell you, temptation does not change 
It, it, it does not change. As long as you're alive and breathing, you're going to have the temptation to gossip. You're going to have the temptation to overindulge. You're going to have the temptation to do things that are out of character. You have got to be so careful to say, is there anything in my life that I am putting in the place of a relationship with Jesus Christ and him being the center of my life? Is there anything in my life right now that I have allowed pleasure, vacation, social media, whatever it may be in my life, to take that center that I spend more time with that God than the true and the living God? Is there anything in my life that I will put in the place of those things? But let me tell you something from the Word of God. Let me read this. But God is faithful. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape. So let me go ahead and say this to everybody that's here today. You may have an addiction in your life. You may have a wrong habit in your life that if you're not careful, that wrong habit will lead to an addiction in your life, and that addiction will become your God. But God is faithful that he will not test you above what you're able to be tested and tempted at because God has a plan for your life, and he will make a way where there is no way. For some of you today, you think, well, I can't change. Anybody ever said that? Well, I can't change. That's just who I am. I'm loud and obnoxious. That's just who I am. But sometimes we need to be quiet and sweet. Sometimes we need to be the person that doesn't have to get the last word. Sometimes we need to be the person that says, God, I know you want to do a work in my life right now. And if I allow this addiction to take over my life, I'm going to let the addiction be the God in my life instead of the true and the living God. Now, how do we overcome addiction? Let's look through the word of God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, as in the futility of their minds. Now that futility word, we don't use that a whole lot, but let me just tell you what that means. That means in the emptiness and pointlessness of our life. We are living in a world and a society today that has no point to life because you cannot get enough new cars You cannot get enough new houses. You cannot have enough religious experiences. You can't have enough and feel that point in your life that's what you need in your life. The only way that that's going to happen is to say, God, you are the center of my life. God, you are. I've got to have right thinking in my life so I can think correctly so that I can do the right thing. Anybody's parents ever said these words to you? You need to correct your attitude. Just going to talk to the worship team. You ever looked at somebody and said, if you don't change, I can help you. I can help you with that attitude. My mother-in-law says it this way. She said, "Uh, y'all got so many tools that we didn't have. If you can't change your attitude, just take their phone. Just take their social media. All my students are looking at me and say, I rebuke that pastor. You got so many things. The reason she was saying that was simply, hey, don't let that become a God in our life. But parents, let's don't let that become a God in our life. Let's get our thinking correct. And you'll see this here. Let's let our our thinking get correct. It says having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings, having given themselves over to lewdness, to work of uncleanliness, with greediness. But you have not learned so Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth in Jesus in, in Christ, in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which 
grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you would put the new man, which is created according to Christ, in true righteousness and in holiness. Now, to share this with you is we've got to put the right things in so the right thoughts come out. If we're not careful in our own life, this is what happens to all of us. We get stuck in something in our life, and because of a thought that's in our life, we get trapped in that thought, and we don't think we can be transformed. For some of you today, you think, well, there's no hope for me. There's no peace for me. There's no joy for me because of something that's happened. And your thought over and over and over again. But when you change the people that you are talking to a lot of times, let me say this because it's going to help somebody. How many of you know somebody if you need to be depressed today you can talk to? They can win a million dollars, and they'll talk about the taxes they have to pay. They, they, they can get the best meal, and then they can talk about, well, I wish we had some dessert. Well, this can happen, this can happen, this can happen. You have got to change your mind the way Christ wants you to change your mind because that addiction has took, taken the place of that and it has darkened your understanding. But when the light of the Word of God comes into your life and starts changing you and you start talking to people and saying, I once was lost, but now I'm found. See, the Scripture tells us that we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word of our testimony. How many of you have got something good happening in your family? Just, just, just wave at me. Something good happened in your family. But we'll talk about what didn't happen in our family so many times. How many of you are thankful that you still got your mom and dad? How many of you are thankful that God allowed you to have children? How many of you are thankful that you do have a job and this Monday's coming? And I know, thank God for the holidays for some of you. But, but the reality of it is you've got a job. Now, it's not where you want to be, but I can thank him if my thoughts are right. The second thing I want to show you is I've got to have the right actions. Notice this in verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. How many of you are thankful for this verse of Scripture? Anybody been angry about anything ever? You know how I know? See, if people are not angry, they're not real. Because some things make you mad. Now, we got to decide about that. Now, notice this. Do not be angry, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place for the devil. Let him who steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Let no, no, well, I didn't like what they did. Well, I didn't like what they said. Nada. No. Not again. Can't do it. I can't allow this to happen in my life. I've got to stop this in my life. What if every single believer in America decided that they would allow no? See, y'all are thinking I'm thinking, well, he doesn't want me to say the, the word. No, no, no. I'm just talking about how you talk about your spouse when they're not around. I'm just talking about the word of saying, I'm not going to talk about my boss that way. I know nobody's ever criticized me for anything. But I'm never going to talk about them in that way. You know how to stop all gossip in your life? Does anybody want to stop gossip in your life? Now, some of you are addicted to it, and this a, we're going to give you steps for that. You know how to stop all gossip in your life? When somebody gossips to you, go to them and just say these words. Well, I know you want to resolve it, so let's go to the person. No, 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 I was just testifying. <laughs> you can stop all gossip in your life. Now, you may your friend list may go down a little bit, but you can stop that. 
by just saying, no, 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 I, want, I know you're a believer. I know you want to reconcile that. I know you want to make everything right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to that person, and at the end of this, we're going to hug and sing Kumbaya. S'mores, campfire, it's going to be good. But see what come, see out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You say, well, it's just what I say. No, 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 it's what's in your heart. See, if I allow those things into my heart, it's going to change my life. And when it changes my life, that God that's become an addiction in my life or is totally changing who I am. Let me, let me tell you this last point. Step three is that we've got to have the right spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I'm going to save the rest of this for just a moment. How many of you have had a story that somebody has done you wrong? Somebody said something about you? Somebody did something to you? Somebody wanted to hijack your reputation and who you were. They just said it. And if we're not careful, we allow bitterness to get in our life. Men, we allow bitterness to get in our life. We have a, a tough facade, and we don't want to cry, and we don't want to show that we hurt our feelings, and we don't want to show all those things, but this is what happens to us. That bitterness gets in there, and because our spirit is not right, this is what happens to us, because our spirit is not right within us, we have to medicate to handle that bitterness, to handle that anger, to handle those things that were done to us. So we medicate on religion. Religion will make you look at somebody, not what Jesus did. Religion will make you look at somebody and say, well, you'll never be good enough. Religion will say to you, well, you'll never kind of have it together. You don't even know the words to the song. You, know, you don't sing the right songs. You don't do the right things. It doesn't happen that way in my life. Religion will take you down and take you down. You see, he came to set the captives free. And I need to tell somebody today, you've allowed that bitterness to get so deep within your heart. It's easy to pick up this, to pick up this, to pick up this, to look holy, but you're just a whitewashed tomb. And God is speaking to us today, and he's saying these words. I'm here to set the captive free. Will you give me that story? Will you give me your story? I wish I could walk to you today. Austin sent up front, so I'm going to walk to Austin. Will you give me your story? If Jesus came to you today and said, Austin, I know a little bit, but if he walked up to you today and said, Austin, will you give me the story? You don't have to talk about it anymore. I came to set the captive free. I came to heal and deliver and set free. It's, it's going to make you the husband that you've always wanted to be. It's going to make you the man that you've always wanted to be. It's going to make you the worshiper that you've always wanted to be. It's going to make you the person that God has called you to be because you don't want to be the father you are right now. You don't want to be the mother, but the addiction has led it. And you think if I'll just self-help enough, you don't need self-help. You need transformation. And the only transformation is going to come is when you say, God, I give you my bitterness. I give you my past. I give you 15. I give you 18. I give you my substance that I've tried to medicate my pain through. And you sit there and you say, God, here it is. 
let me say, let me say this to you. This is this does not minimize what happened to you. You were abused and it was wrong. You were mistreated and it was wrong. You were hurt. They said they had never left. And all you can still hear is the slam of the door. And what has happened to you is you've allowed work to become your addiction. You've allowed your position to become your addiction. You've allowed making everybody else feel bad your drug of choice. You've allowed their approval instead of God's approval to become your addiction. You've allowed. And God is saying, will you give it to me? Will you give me your life? if you will, for just a moment. Because somebody's making a decision right now that's going to change your life forever. If you'll just give me just another moment. I'm going to say this to you with all the love that I possibly can. You cannot overcome the addiction. If you don't get the bitterness and the malice and the unforgiveness under the blood, you may beat alcohol, but you'll just pick up another addiction. You may beat it, and you may be lost. You'll be a found person that everybody else hates to be around. (laughs) But if you'll let God, take you where you are right now and say, God, I need you to take this from me. I know I'm taking some time, but there's somebody here today, man, you've carried it for so long. You've carried that bitterness. You've carried that unforgiveness. Some of you have had severe disappointment in life. That you've been so disappointed, you're medicating because you've been disappointed. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right there where you are. I know that Jesus came today to set the captive free. I know that Jesus came today. That some of you have been hit and hit and hit and then hit again. And you use the substance to mask the pain. You've used religion to mask the pain. You've, you've used building a business to mask the pain. But today, will you say, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my life. I don't want to leave here with the addiction. But also, I don't want to leave here, leave here with the bitterness, the anger. God, I want you to take hold of my life. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything besides right there in your seat to say, Jesus, I give it to you. I give my heart. I give my bitterness. God, I don't want to carry this anymore. And I know if I'll give you that, you'll make a way for me to be free. And I no longer have to be addicted. I can have Jesus Christ at the center of my life. Right there where you are, I want you to pray. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, in the name that's above every name, I know you're doing a special work in somebody's life right now. I know you're doing a special work in somebody's life right now. God, I I lay down the bitterness. I lay down the strife. 
I lay down the disappointment. I lay down the abuse. God, we know it hurts and it happened. But God, right now, we lay all those things down at the foot of the cross. Lord, I want to walk in freedom like never before in my life. God, the disappointments of my past, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the shame. God, I lay on by the foot of the altar, never to take up again, because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If you've laid down bitterness and strife and anger and disappointment, just right there where you are, and this is going to be an act of faith for some of you, I want you to lift both hands to heaven right now and say, I'm free in Jesus' name. I'm free in Jesus' name. I am free in Jesus' name. I am free in Jesus' name. I am free in Jesus' name. And by the grace of God, I am free. I am free. Praise God. Praise God. I want the team to come. If you will, stand with me right now. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to say two things before they sing this again. I want to say two things to you. One is, you say, Pastor, I don't know if I can change who I am. You can't by yourself. But I will tell you, there's a group of people that will help you. You need to join a small group. You need to be a part of something. And then the second thing, and I always say this around here, when we talk about this, you say, Pastor, I need somebody to talk to. The church loves you, and we have some of those generous, good people that you could ever imagine. But if you say, Pastor, I think I need some counseling, I need somebody to talk to, this church will take care of that for you. Because we don't want anybody that is in that bondage to ever walk out of here and not get help. So we believe that together. So we're trusting that in Jesus.